Welcome everybody to our NASA North panel. Uh, the land is queer, community, collective, uh, and land-oriented approaches to Indigenous queer theory life and politics. Um, I just want to take a second to welcome everybody to the virtual space. Um, it's really such an honor to be here with each of you, and I'm so happy we could come together uh, and make this happen in some capacity um, across all these different places and time zones uh, and create a space that really centers and, and prioritizes uh, Indigenous queerness. Uh, and so this panel uh, was inspired uh, out of some of the work that we're doing at Deshinta through some of our programs. Um, so part of our mandate um, at Deshinta is ensuring that the education we offer is accessible um, to all community members, which includes parents, youth, women, as well as two-spirit, um, trans, and uh, queer folks. Uh, and so it's very important to us that we create uh, and center Indigenous, queer, two-spirit, and LGBTQ uh, individuals and their theories and practices in both the academic uh, and in the land-based work uh, that we do. Uh, in addition to, we also take the approach that Indigenous land-based education is like inherently queer. Um, and we're continually learning and trying to find ways with each new program to celebrate queerness and really make uh, an effort to reject some of these uh, colonial and binary ways of viewing and engaging with with ourselves, each other, uh, and, and the land. Uh, so yeah, today's panel is really important, and I can't express how glad I am to see you all here. Uh, and I think one of the main goals of this panel is to have it be grounded in your own work and lives, and to really like offer a space to talk about how queer theory, queerness, and queering is is actualized in your own work, uh, in the academy, in your homes on the land and, and in your communities. Uh, and so I think we're gonna start here uh, just by going around and introducing ourselves. Um, and so I'll introduce myself just briefly as one of the, the organizers of this panel. Uh, my name is Sydney. I work at the Deshinta Center for Research uh, and Learning. I just drove up to Yellowknife um, on Friday. Uh, from Calgary and we are setting up to host our Hyde camp this week, which will be three weeks uh, and uh, it's beautiful and sunny out right now. And I'm really excited to, to get out on the land with everyone uh, tomorrow. Uh, and before I worked at Deshinta a couple years ago, my uh, grad school work, which is where I met Ryan actually, uh, was focused on gendering and, and queering how we understand uh, settler colonial power in Canada. Uh, and I looked particularly at the role of white women, gender diverse and queer folks uh, in the ongoing colonization of this place. Uh, and I was trying to think through uh, some of the nece necessary work that now has to be done to, to try and redress this colonial history. Uh, and so I guess I see my role at Deshinta as, as maybe a practical kind of continuation of some of this work. Um, yeah, enough about me. So uh, I'm really excited today. Um, and Ryan, who is uh, the co-chair of this panel and has also been a casual employee at Deshinta is gonna help with facilitating the discussion. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll hand it off to you now, Ryan. But yeah, thank you everyone for being here and I'm really looking forward to it. Merci. Awesome, thanks Sydney. Um, and just again, really appreciative for doing a lot of the um, the, the difficult work of organizing schedules and putting this all together, just um, really wanted to uh, make that, um, to, to acknowledge that work, a lot of that important work. Um, yeah, um, um, uh, my name is Ryan Crosschild. Uh, my Blackfoot name is Sikabyokkitopi, which translates to um, Great Horse Rider. Um, I am in my, third year of a PhD at the University of Calgary um, in the political science uh, department, kind of looking at um, what queerness means in terms of kind of indigenous resurgence and uh, kind of indigenous nationalisms and trying to think through some of those um, kinds of complicated questions. Um, that's kind of where my, where my uh, interest with um, Kind of queerness first emerged, but also to just within my own kind of lived experiences um, as someone who's kind of actively involved in kind of traditional Blackfoot society governance, 
um, navigating a lot of kind of um, traditional ceremonial spaces and the the, the tensions um, that exist with these kinds of um, really prevalent kind of gendered masculine heteropatriarchal um, instances of kind of protocol practice um, and and being kind of thinking about it not just in theory and writing about it but also feeling it being in those spaces and it's it's added something that um, has uh, kind of um, provided different kinds of I think um, insights that I think you you it, it's hard to to gather that from just reading about it um, and I think that that is something that I'm really looking forward to um, talking to everyone here about is the 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 connection between theory and and practice and I think that that practical aspect is something that um, has been missing sometimes at least in the academic literature um, has been my my sense um, and yeah I I just wanted to acknowledge both um, Sarah and Alex as being kind of really big inspirations in my own work and um, within your writings and so I just wanted to acknowledge that and I am very 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 um, feel very privileged and honored to be sharing space with the both of you and also to have Sydney here. Um, it just is a, a really good kind of, um, it, it feels really good. So I'll leave it at that um, and maybe I'll pass it over to um, Alex. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Sydney and Ryan. Um, it's great to see you and uh, Sarah as well. And, um, you know, it's not often that we get to you know, talk about these kinds of issues with like-minded people. So for me, this is super exciting. Um, so wasanas and tisnigas and apaskwak, pamaskatapa and apaskwak, ochinina. So I'm from the apaskwak Cree Nation, and the place where my family lives is called Pamaskatapan, and where I live right now is on um, Clearwater Lake. But in Cree, we call it a tigameg, which is means whitefish and Right now, there's lots of whitefish that are visible. The ice is still kind of moving, but um, from the shores, it's gone. So you can see suckers and whitefish. So it's a really exciting time of year. Um, this is where our family, my grandmother's family fish camp was. So when she was young, they used to walk out here from the, from the river where the main settlement is, which is about 25 miles. And, um, and we found some arrowheads and pottery here, and someone even found some pemmican. So that's, it's pretty cool to, to know that this is the same lands that, you know, we have lived on for thousands and thousands of years and um, continuously. So that is kind of the grounding for the work that, that I do in the academic world, but also in my personal life is um, a lot of it is around um, learning about the land here and all the relations that go along with that, you know, the plants, animals, the water, and then the sky as well, and then figuring out how to continue to protect that. And, and then in my professional um, work life, I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, and um, we have a master's of Indigenous land based education. And so it is people that are teachers that are doing land-based education, whether it's on a community level or in the K to 12 system or, or even um, undergrad uh, and, and graduate school. And so our focus is pedagogy. And one of the courses that we, what we have for the program is called Queering Land-Based Education. So that's been an exciting course to put together, but also to see how it evolves and um as as you said ryan and and sydney um you know colonialism has impacted us in ways that are in many ways irreversible but in other ways um there are these threads of queerness that have always existed and so uh, you know sarah's work kind of draws on that, those threads and and so that's what we're trying to do as well is to find the queer in the in the land-based education and um you know you see uh students that graduate and then they go back and they're teachers and then it doesn't take very long before they're pressured into 
reinforcing or reifying the colonial agenda again, and this time they just take it outside. So I think that that's, you know, one thing that I'm, we're trying to um, really focus on. How does that happen? Why does it happen? And how can we give some life to, um, to other approaches that, you know, are based on our own worldviews? So I will pass it to my friend and colleague, Sarah. Thank you, Gila Kessler. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation um, to gather with you today. I am always yearning for these kinds of conversations and I'm just really grateful um, to be able to have a bit of this uh, conversation with you all. I really admire the work that you all do. So it's wonderful to see you. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm Sarah Hunt. Uh, my Kwakwa name is uh, Tlari Tlilogwa, uh, which means um, that through her, the whale blows in the house. Um, so a connection to the undersea world, um, to our relatives of the uh, deep in the ocean, uh, where we're all oriented to here on the coast. Um, so I'm uh, Kwagil of the Kwakwa people from Tahis uh, or Fort Rupert on the northern part of the island. And um, I'm also Zawadenuk, um, which is from Kinkam Inlet uh, or Gwaii uh, through my grandmother. And um, I've grown up here uh, on the Kwangan territories. So I'm also uh, Ukrainian English through my mom and I grew up uh, with her here in the Kwangan territories. So just down the coast from uh, where my Kwakwakiwak relatives are, are from. Um, and so I am, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of when my interest in these issues sort of began. I think, uh, you know, a lot of my work, starting from when I was a teenager, was kind of about two things, uh, about um, kind of environmental issues. So the first rally I spoke at when I was 14 was around um, the protecting the old growth forest here. Uh, so I skipped grade nine to go and, and attend that and ended up speaking. So I had that real passion for thinking about our lands and waters, um, and also then about gender-based violence and, and intimate violence in our homes. And so, you know, really from when I was a young person trying to hold those two things together, um, those different kind of scales of, of colonial violence. And uh, then for a long time, um, you know, working on uh, issues of justice in our, in our homes, in our intimate relations, and really seeing how those have become depoliticized often in favor of thinking about dispossession in relation to land. Um, and for me, they're very much interconnected. And so uh, I'm now here um, at UVic. So I'm uh, Canada Research Chair in, in, in Political Ecology, so um, in Indigenous Political Ecology. And uh, I keep making the rounds in the disciplines. So gender studies, geography, <laughs> um, and here I am now in environmental studies. and. Um, really trying to uh, think about how we can reimagine and reenact justice across those scales of, of our bodies, our families, our homes, and, and the lands and waters. Uh, and really centering, uh, you know, for me as a, as a Kwak 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 person, um, the worldview, uh, the pra cultural practices, the language and teachings um, within my own uh, nation and community, but also making connections across uh, kind of coastal nations and thinking about how we've governed relationally and how we create knowledge relationally and can reimagine and, and really think about um, justice, uh, kind of Indigenous law and justice is often, I think, traced through stories, which are often today um, held by, you know, we've kind of internalized a lot of colonial ideas about gender and power, I think. So uh, just seeing that in, in my own community, but also in communities I've worked in where, um, you know, people are seen as being authoritative, it's often the men. Um, so, you know, the, the ways that ideas about patriarchy have um, kind of been internalized even in our ceremonial spaces where it's kind of hereditary chiefs were taught are only men, where speakers are only men, um, where a lot of the people who hold those stories are, are often men. And um, so for me thinking about um, queerness and queering our relations uh, is also about that anti-violence work. It's about changing the terms in which we think about culture, power and authority, um, and our who, you know, how we can have relationships with, with our lands and waters. 
Um, but it is also, um, I think for me about more accurately reflecting our worldview. So within uh, the Kwakwala language, within Kwakwaka culture, it's really all about transformation stories, moving between worlds, moving between forms. Um, that is so central. That is really what all of our protocols, um, our practices are rooted in is, is, is those teachings and um, the obligations that flow, flow from them. And so uh, it's not only kind of countering you know, ideas of patriarchy and colonialism, but it's really about centering the, the fullness of gender diverse relations, culturally diverse roles, um, and the necessity of having all of those at the center if we wanna you know, truly express who we are. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about what I kind of have in mind here today. Um, I think that those uh, kind of introductory remarks kind of really do set us up um, in a good way to, to really get into these um, first two questions. You both kind of um, have already touched on the first one, which is um, kind of just a, an overview of, of queerness or querying and um, thinking about where, um, where that stands kind of in relation to our own work and how we think about that. Um, Kind of as a theory and as a practice, and and I've had conversations um, um, with uh, with both um, you, Sarah, and Alex about this. Um, this it seems like this interesting kind of um, disconnect between what we talk about as queer Indigenous theory and also kind of uh, the, the the practice of it. Um, on one hand, there seems to be kind of um, this uh, understanding of like. Not, not really having queer Indigenous theory or um, that the theory that a lot of people are kind of uh, engaging with or producing predominantly, I think, within the academy um, seems to struggle in some ways to translate into uh, actual practical application of what a lot of that means. And so um, maybe I think it would be, um, uh, it might be helpful to start there. And I'll kind of talk about my own um, my own kind of approach to understanding queerness. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm, I approach this from my work, kind of looking at queer Blackfoot traditions, really trying to understand um, where queerness is in a lot of Blackfoot traditions and a lot of like Blackfoot life ways and practices. And for a long time, I had a hard time seeing that. Um, a lot of people um, who are knowledge keepers, elders, kind of reinforce this idea that we were very much uh, kind of uh, this warring, really masculine kind of uh, culture uh, where men were in these uh, kinds of positions of power. Um, but what I noticed is that as queerness, part of it is like, um, it's, it's restoring um, a lot of these dominant narratives that kind of get um, talked about as though they are the only way, like this is the only story, the only interpretation of it. Um, and as you start talking to different elders, especially Blackfoot women, um, some gender and sexually diverse individuals who are also um, uh, knowledge keepers, you start to see that the same story can be interpreted very differently depending on your own kinds of um, standpoints on it. And so you start to see that there is um, this uh, kind of unthreading of those dominant narratives of kind of like Blackfoot just being super hyper-masculine um, as you engage with a lot of these, these creation stories, a lot of these other um, historical figures as well. Um, in in um, the, one of the more well-known individuals um, that a lot of people point to, not just in Blackfoot, but in the scholarship is uh, Running Eagle. Bitamaka, and they were uh, kind of uh, described as um, the, the the literal translation is manly hearted women woman, which is a really like it speaks volumes to like the inadequacies of a lot of the early anth um, anthropologists trying to um, translate these practices. But it was this 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 um, running eagle who was portrayed masculine kinds of uh, characteristics was a warrior, was a, was a chief, um, kind of had their own um, ceremonial society um, and had many uh, 
both husbands and wives. And so they found that very kind of interesting. And they started to do a lot more research on, on Blackfoot practices of kind of, I guess you could call it um, queerness. And that there was this like um, this, it's documented in the archives of, of this being uh, 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 there. But we also know that through a lot of um, oral tradition. But it's not known in a lot of the kind of more mainstream um, ceremonial circles because those stories are not valued. They're not seen as important. And so I think part of what queerness is going back to this is it's about restoring or recentering a lot of these things that, that have been kind of pushed, um, relegated to the periphery of indigenous life, politics, um, ceremony, ways of knowing. Um, and so that's kind of how I entered into this um, with trying to connect the theory to the practice. Um, and then moving on now to where I'm at today, that's what my master's thesis was on. But right now what I'm struggling with is um, as I've been reading more uh, queer indigenous theory, pre predominantly uh, a lot of it emerges out of, I think, English lit. Um, it's really almost opaque. Um, to the point where I, I can't really connect with it. Um, I don't know, a lot of it is, is talking about um, queer indigeneity as kind of imagining and otherwise or acting otherwise. And I think that th those are really good kinds of um, places to start. Um, but there also seems to be this desire to move away from the past or this, there seems to be this debate of how productive it is to turn to the past, to turn to tradition, to kind of enact these queer indigenous futures. And I see that mostly with a lot of younger, um, I think queer indigenous scholars, writers. Um, and for me, that's difficult because on one hand, I understand a lot of the, the, the violence that exists in these spaces, but I also understand them as being in like really important to our sense of intimacies to like, they can be quite, a generative and, and, and powerful spaces, um, as well as being very violent. And so it's this kind of this complicating uh, on both sides, I, I feel as being actively involved, but also knowing a lot of the conversations and feeling that violence myself, it's been really hard to, to navigate where a lot of this is, the, the conversations that are being kind of drummed up. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there. I know it's kind of, might be hard to um, land on <laughs> anything in particular that, that I said, but uh, I'm wondering how, um, if either of you wanted to respond or to kind of just talk about your own um, understanding between the theory and practice part. Sarah, do you want to go or? I can if you want to or unless you do. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. That gives me, um, you know, so much to, so much of what you said, I think really resonates um, in, in my own context, especially the, you know, the real role of anthropology and, and kind of archival documentation, which we turn to, we, we were looking for, you know, those traces of our, of ourselves, of our histories and, and our families and, um, you know, my my family has been heavily documented by anthropologists. Uh, my great great grandfather worked with Franz Boas, so George Hunt. Um, there's been so much, uh, you know, just just growing up, uh, I was able to take courses that had my family member. But really, uh, in more recent years, have just realized how um, skewed and partial that representation was just absolutely no interest in um, talking to anyone besides the men. And yet so much of the knowledge that was brought in uh, was actually from, uh, from women uh, in, in our families. Um, and uh, I've been, that's, that's actually some of the work I've been doing more recently is really to try to revisit those original sources and to reread them, to, to look at them um, with a different lens. But uh, you know, so much of the erasures uh, and the gaps, I think, that come from um, how those representations have been, again, kind of internalized as true as our as part of our history when it's so partial. Uh, and um, 
yeah, I mean, a lot of what I've been trying to look at is how uh, the management of our of our lands and waters, so how the actual um, you know practices of uh, tending to you know cultivating our our lands of um, uh, you know all the various ways that we've um, had relationships with our various parts of our of our territories and um, how that was managed and the decision making that happened, how that was passed on through families was um, was uh, has been left out. You know, it, it's not um, told. I guess the kind of gendered nature of that and the and how that was rooted in family structures, which required different roles. And those were not gendered roles necessarily, you know, that we need all of those different roles. We need people with all of this diverse kinds of knowledge. And so, um, you know, the way that that's been now put into, well, men do this and women do that and everyone else is kind of erased is so, is so partial. Again, if we are thinking about things like resurgence and revitalization of our, of our cultural practices, of our laws, um, that if we think about them in those terms, we're always going to be missing a huge you know, um, not just the people, but actually the knowledge and the roles and responsibilities, which are not along gendered lines, but are actually along family lines. They're passed on through different families. So, um, yeah, I think that anthropology is, and our history here, um, which in which our kind of cultural and legal forms were turned into art, you know, when, when in fact they marked and mark particular relationships to specific places within our territories, um, you know, that fracturing has been so harmful and is very gendered. Um, so that that really resonates with me. And, and also just the huge gap between that and the practice in our, in our um, both in our kind of everyday relationships with, with land, um, but also in our cultural practices. So within the potlatch, within the big house and our fee system, um, I mean, our families are really queer. <laughs> There's a lot of queers. Uh, and for me going to, you know, growing up, going to ceremony, being, being a part of our, our feast system, um, you know, seeing that there's a lot of unnamed, you know, not necessarily people with a label to go with it, but um, so-called kind of, uh, you know, women taking up what would be maybe seen in English as taking up a, a man's role, like at the drum, or what has been labeled a man's role at the drum, um, but it's just super normalized. Those kinds of things are happening all the time. They're just not talked about or, or named. There's no label or, or term necessarily. It's just a cultural role. It's normalized that that person has been, um, that's the particular knowledge that they carry. And it's, uh, it's, it's normalized. So um, no one really has talked about it, but in trying to make sense of my own, um, you know, sort of how we can have that on the one hand, and yet also have these teachings that men do this and women do that, you know, that how, how do those go together? So for me, there's just those gaps in the lived realities of gender and sexual diversity and these gendered teachings, which I do really think have been imposed through especially anthropology and the, the the forms of documentation, but also the, um, you know, of course we have had the impacts of here of things like obviously residential schools and other ways that those, th that gender binary and kind of heteropatriarchal ideas about the family and, you know, have, have been imposed, but also then internalized and changed how we, um, how we think about um, cultural practice and, and land-based practice. So, yeah, that that's. I think it really connects maybe with um with in a very different cultural context, but um really the anthropology is a huge problem, um which is why I did try to go into anthropology in my undergrad and I took like half a class and and left running and screaming to gender studies, but um uh, just I was wanted to pick up also on what you were talking about in terms of theory. I think for me. Uh, because I've really, in recent years, especially wanted to, um, I feel like the scholarship has taken me away from my own cultural teachings because there's not a lot of scholarship that centers um, Kwakwakiwak worldview or a coastal worldview here. So um, because I've really wanted to 
uh, I've kind of come to realize that that has to be part of my homecoming, you know, part of my um, my centering our my my own cultural worldview and practices and um, making sense of myself in that way. Uh, part of that is actually connected to my name. So, you know, I, I received my name when I was um, seven or eight and um, I didn't know what it was for a long time. And then when I, once I got it written down, I didn't know what it meant. So it's like been this kind of ongoing process of, of um, uh, coming to be able to, I guess, make sense of myself um, through, through my name. And then realizing, you know, my name makes sense in a particular place and in relation to, again, within those family roles, within the ancestors that that name traces back to. Um, and so it's part of being able to make sense of myself, again, because I feel like, you know, um, for in trying to think about who I am as a queer person, so many of those English language terms don't really match up with, with how I understand myself. But my name is something that does have a meaning and a role within a larger um, system in my community. Um, but I can really only fully understand that if I'm able to immerse myself more in our language and um, in the in the practices in in working alongside my relatives as well. So, um, so yeah, as I've thought about then the role of of scholarship and theory, so much like I, I, there just isn't a queer theory of of you know Kwakiutl um, ways of being like that. That's not something that I can find in the literature. So uh, I have I also find it really interesting that a lot of the the work on um, Indigenous queer theory is not written is written by non-Indigenous scholars who I'm sure do have a role and, and a place, but I really am um, because of the the way that our stories were written by others for so many you know decades. I'm really interested in um, wanting to like close that gap of self-representation as part of our um, self-determination, and so. You know, that's also wanting to center scholarship that allows for our stories to be told through our own perspectives. I think that um, I'm unclear about how a lot of the queer theory and literature, again, matches up with our lived expressions today. So, yeah, those are some of my thoughts. Maybe Alex can take it from here. Yeah, I think there's so many similarities in, in kind of our trajectories. Um, you know, looking at um, like our own lives growing up and how, you know, in my my world here, um, it was normalized to be queer, but then entering the school system was the time when things shifted. And um, uh, when I did go to graduate school, went through that process too of looking at what anthropologists had written and, and you know, found the same thing. It's like, what, how did they come up with that? Like, here's this beautiful story. And then here's this odd conclusion that doesn't even make sense. And really all they wanted to know in the end was, was that actually a male or actually a female? Like that was their primary concern. Um, and then the other um, weird kind of thing that came out of that, like, you know, there's, there wasn't a lot of scholarship in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Most of it was from the West Coast, really. And then a lot focused on, uh, focused on um, Navajo or Dine. And, um, and then this odd thing happened where there was this complete romanticization of, of queerness. And, but it was through a very male gaze. And so you would get these odd statements like, um, you know, before the term two spirit was used, but let's put the term two spirit in now two spirit people raise the children. It's like only a, a cisgendered man would say that, like, you know, it's so obviously anyway, but there's these like narratives like that, that he mentioned, and they've been internalized by our, now we go to, um, two spirit teachings or whatever, and you'll hear a lot of these stereotypes or these, um, narratives repeated and many of them were created by anthropologists so that's another kind of layer to this whole thing um, so unraveling that thread too has been has been a bit of a challenge because of course you know people are wanting so so bad to have something positive 
some kind of link to the past that's positive. And, um, and some of those romanticized stories do that. Uh, so they've kind of filled that role, but at the same time, um, if, for example, in Swampy Cree, our end dialect here, like when I was really like in my early twenties, when I was doing my undergrad, I started asking the elders about, you know, what, what was life before around sexuality and gender. And, um, we didn't have a term for queer. We didn't have a term for gay. We didn't have a term for um, trans or two spirit. And um, when I asked them, they said, well, I asked my grandma that she said, well, it's just the part of normal. Like we didn't have those, those kind of um, terms. Um, and then you read Mendelbaum, who's like written extensively about the Cree and runs into one person uh, who had a name that was descriptive. So, you know, tying back to what you, you said, Sarah, about, about your name and how naming was just a part of, a big part of our kinship structure and relationality um, that, they, that that anthropologist took that name and now people take it as the word for um, queer Cree, men mostly, but are, you know, male identified. Um, and no, is that that good? Yeah, it's good in many ways because it's an anchor for people to say, see, we existed. Um, we shouldn't have to, you know, we shouldn't have to say, prove that we have existed. Proof, there's proof enough that we're here now, you know, just to say that we have always existed. But, but it's also can be problematic because again, it, it leads to a certain kind of um, heteropatriarchal narrative. And the same with some of our um, our ongoing creation stories and our that are linked to our cosmology. And pe people have never said it to me, but they've said it to my students about things that I've written or said um, that, you know, oh, that's not true. That's a male character. And I'm not going to say that the, the one I'm talking about. Um, but I mean, you could probably transfer this to other languages as well, um, that there's always going to be some kind of resistance, especially when um, it doesn't align uh, with heteropatriarchy. So those practices, protocols, procedures um, that, pra that align neatly with heteropatriarchy are the ones that are reinforced and the other ones are kind of, you know, set aside, like, why is um, not speeding on the ground not a protocol when a skirt, wearing a skirt is so, you know, and even just how the skirt became such a, an emblem or symbol of indigeneity, especially indigenous femininity um, and creation itself, really, um, you know, that, that can take, um, we could have a whole panel on just unpacking how that happens, but um, the impact of it is um, harmful. And um, almost every week I get either a phone call or a Facebook message from a teacher, a mother, a parent, um, a sibling of somebody, usually a youth who's been ostracized or marginalized because of their clothing um, or because of some traditional teachings and this happened here like just the other day so on Wednesday I have to go and kind of try to undo that by saying yes we do exist because one of the elders here said that two-spirit people don't exist and and there were actual um you know queer kids in in that group so um so I guess this really does link back to that relationality and and in Cree we do have queer theory um, a lot of people talk about or write about Wakoto and like people have started to use that term more in, in um, academic writing. Um, but what they usually don't talk about are the things that go along with that. So um, like Pastahuan, which is when you cross a, a sacred line. Um, and then Ochiniwan, which is are the consequences that happen when you do harm. So that's all part of our kinship structure and a relational framework. That's, that's our queer theory, because if that was uh, um, followed, then we, there wouldn't be this um, kind of violence that's going on, lateral violence, but also 
there'd be a different understanding of the way that colonial violence is internalized in our communities. Um, one of my one of my dear friends, Kalani Young, Dr. Kalani Young is um, from the uh, Kanaka Mali from the Kingdom of Hawaii. And we're we've been talking about queering and what that means. And I really love and I, I always repeat her quote because I think it's so powerful that queering is transforming poison into medicine. And that's that's queer indigenous theory. And so how does that happen? What are the ways that that happens? And I think um, for all of us here, um, we're the bodies that kind of ingest that poison often, whether it's theory or practice or, or um, dreams or whatever. And then our role kind of has been to ingest and, and um, spit it out in a, in a way that um, is helpful to others. And I don't know if this is true or not, but, um, they say that like uh, the reason why peacocks are, are blue is because they they ingest poison and and then the poison turns their um, plumage blue. And it was actually Manu Meyer that told me that because we, we were invited to the palace in, in Hawaii and they had peacocks outside and they said that's the reason why they, the um, leadership had peacocks was to, you know, ingest all the poison that might be coming in. So metaphorically and 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 um, in reality, I think that is that is kind of our role, um, or maybe a role we've taken on, or a role that's been forced upon us. But um, to be kind of that um, the transformation um, that you were talking about, Sarah, and um, uh, just also linking it to our land here, like in the spring when the ice breaks it's such a significant time and if you think about the past like of course it would be because now you can get fresh water um, instead of having to melt it and haul water um, but also you know it's just such a beautiful sight when ice is, is candling and move, starting to move and um, the word for it I, I think it was matches done means like transformation so spring is, you know, often kind of seen as a time of transformation, like in the seasons, but also in terms of um, our theory and our knowledge. And um, I think that, you know, one of the things that the elders here crave is like discussions, ph philosophical discussions, because often they're just asked for like, what does this word mean? How, like a noun based kind of understanding and and then, you know, thinking about queering as, as action and um, Sarah, you've written about this too in your everyday decolonization, um, you know, queer the noun, queer the verb. And um, I think what we're all trying to do is, is queering the verb. Um, so I think there's so many ways that that's happening. And um, perhaps something to look forward to is thinking about a way that we can strengthen our traditional kinship structures, but also kind of use that coming in approach theory to um, create and strengthen uh, a queer um, um, and support the, the necessity for a queer kinship structure and how can that be done within, which, within each of our language and familiar groups. Um, but, but I was like, both of you touched on some really, really important, um, things that I've been kind of thinking through and struggling with as well. Um, but I also think, uh, the, the naming part, I think is so important. And so my name, Sikapiokitopi, means great horse rider. And it's actually connected to a really important ceremony that takes place at, um, our Akukatsun or, uh, Sundance ceremony. And there's a part where I have to ride a horse as part of one of the ceremonies. The funny thing about it is I'm actually really allergic to horses and um, I'm allergic to so many different things, to different kinds of grass, um, just like the oftentimes when we have our, our sun dance, it's in like a time where there's crazy, crazy amounts of um, forest fire smoke in the air. And it makes me extremely, extremely sick because I mean, for anyone it would, but for me, like it's it's like on another level on top of having to ride a horse 
And so I have to do that because it's a responsibility, but I'm doing it and I'm, I'm, swe I'm swelling up, but I know that that's my responsibility. I'm, I'm embodying that name, living uh, out those relational obligations. But I think another part of it too is like thinking how different bodies relate to the land differently. And I think that's something that is starting to really um, be talked more about that has, I, I'm not sure if it's been, um, Kind of on the periphery or if it's just getting more attention now but it's something that i've definitely noticed um also being involved in different kinds of ceremonial settings that you do like as queering as a verb you can you can um adjust certain ceremonial practices for some people i see it all the time who are in wheelchairs and we have to move like there's there's we we, we definitely do um queer that practice in order to have that person participate the more important thing is that people are able to participate um, in the way that that they are able to that they want to um, and so it's interesting to see that in some settings that is okay but in others when it comes to gender or sexual diversity it's it's met with such resistance um, and so that's one thing that i've been thinking through but also like for myself um, it's interesting i have such an interesting relationship with the land um it's it's always a struggle for me to be out engaging in these um practices um i also have really um kind of this uh like ulnar nerve damage in my hands and so it really affects my um my fine motor skills it's really hard for me to tie knots and it feels like every kind of ceremonial thing now has to do with tying things and I just can't, it's really hard for me to do it. And so there's a, there's a slowing of time, like queerness is like slowing down. And I think that if you, if you expand upon that, like um, all of us who are engaged in this kind of work, or when we're in the academy, there's this, there's this pressure to produce constantly. You're on this fast paced rhythm. You're onto the next kind of meeting, you're onto the next project. And it really does kind of, it makes it difficult to, to um to actually engage in the in the practice part of it um and so as being involved in those spaces that's something that i've really and i think covid um kind of got us to recognize the like the slowing down of things um that were super complicated but um i think that was one of the things also too is um just that um really bringing to the to the to the forefront is how bodies react differently to the land and the amount of um uh kind of critical awareness um that needs to go into that especially some of the things that i've been encountering is um again when we're talking about the importance of land the importance of these place-based practices but how that has been used at least in the blackfoot context in kind of harmful ways, especially during COVID, where it's like we need to continue fulfilling our relational obligations to the land, to the animals, with the treaties we've made with them, with the bundles that that um, comprise our relationships, our treaties with the animals, with the more than humans. We have to continue having ceremony. We have to continue gathering. And that created a whole bunch of um, conflicting ethical commitments of how do we do this safely and some people didn't they didn't adjust their their approach they just said the more important thing is we continue doing it and those who wanted to adjust accordingly were kind of again labeled as um not being fully committed to our ways of doing things our way of life and so again it's it's an understanding that that conflict of how do we negotiate those conflicting responsibilities especially right now in a pandemic where you have ethical responsibilities to make sure that you're not spreading the virus to um, people in your family people who are immunocompromised but also this understanding of responsibility to ceremony to these place-based practices where um, it's not just the sake of ceremony. There's like a reason behind why we do these things. There's a reason why there's some ceremonies that are attached to certain seasons. It's a part of that renewal. It's part of that fulfilling those relational obligations to the, the human, more than human bonds that we have. And so that's something that, again, that I've, I've been struggling with um, because I do think that a commitment, uh, almost a, uh, 
this commitment to place-based practices can also enact harmful relationality. And that's something that I've, again, have been really seeing um, and struggling with um, in, in kind of, especially during the pandemic. Um, but the other thing too is um, going back to um, this idea of transforming poison into medicine, I really do um, connect with that as well. Um, and I think that it speaks also to a lot of us who are um, kind of identify as, as queer and indigenous. Um, there's been this, um, there's this uh, article, I'm not sure if either of you have read by Jody Bird, it's what's uh, normativity got to do with it. Um, again, very theoretically dense, but it talks about like the tensions with um, Leanne's a concept of um, kind of queer normativity and trying to make queerness normal in Indigenous spaces. And then Jody Bird just saying, well, then if, if normativity or queerness is something to champion, what is left to critique of like normativity? Like what is queerness then? Um, and so it kind of, it, it sets this interesting question up. Um, and also the tension with identifying queerness as the noun or an identity and what queerness is, is like praxis or as a, as a, the verb, right? And I think that that sets up a, a binary itself as an either or. Um, and I do really think that just the, the act or the, the very fact that a lot of us are queer and indigenous, just the way we carry ourselves in a lot of these spaces, the, the, the tension, the conflict that we're um, consistently navigating, um, it has in some way made us, I think, more aware of um, this, this art of relationality. And I think that that is something that we're, we're I don't wanna universalize, but I think that the, just those, those embodied experiences of understanding the complexities within being in certain spaces, at least in my own experience, um, knowing that this one particular individual or knowledge holder is really problematic um, when it comes to gender um, protocols and reinforcing them, but also understanding the wealth of knowledge they have outside of that, that it's not as black and white. And I have really started to see that. And it, it creates a lot of, um, again, how do we, how do, we do that um, um, kinship with people who are good kinship with bad kin. And I think that that was something that um, in one of the last panels, um, Max Liberon talked about as um, that is part of what queering relationality is. It's how to do good, good kinship with bad kin sometimes. And bad kin can be those who reinforce these, these kinds of practices. Um, but it could also be things like um, heteropatriarchy. It could be things like um, uh, kind of conservative masculinist interpretations of indigenous nationalisms. And so um, it's in a way, the way I've been approaching it is like queerness as also a form of like political harm reduction um, as trying to reduce the harms, but sometimes doing this work is really, really tiring. And I think there's this pressure for people who are queer and indigenous to almost um, be consistently resisting, be consistently being creative and being super queer all the time. And for me, like I'm, that's not me. I don't like conflict. I'm, I'm always tired. Um, and so I think, especially for those of us who are in academia or even when you're like activist circles, you're working with nonprofits, it's tiring and um, it, there's this pressure to consistently resist, to consistently deconstruct to queer spaces that I think um, that in and of itself really um, leads to burnout. Um, I mean, that alone is really hard for indigenous peoples to navigate in these spaces, but you add in the complexities of, of queerness and trying to, to queer decolonize spaces and like it, it, it has, it carries a toll on a person to the point where you just, you're so tired. There's so much to do. There's so much um, stuff that you have to start planning for that it can, um, that, that, that pressure to perform, I think is something that needs to be um, um, critically looked at. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I'm not sure if any of you wanna pick up on that or wanted to ask another question, but 
that's kind of what your what your contributions got me thinking about. I think um, I I came to a point where I just gave up on resistance uh, because it's, it's going to kill you. <laughs> um, and so focus on the queering part and, and uh, the super queer part I actually love. Um, so how can we be super queers? <laughs> uh, and I mean that like, honestly, like um, the humor and the life-giving fun part of being queer and queering um, you know, that's, to me, that's what gives me the energy and, um, the playfulness and the joy and, you know, um, creating community that's uplifting and, and supportive. And then you can, you can still do the hard work, but, um, if you're always in a mode of resistance, you're, you're going to stay in a mode of resistance. I think I, that's what I found for myself anyway. Um, so queering seems more generative. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I would add to that. But I, I know what you mean. I mean, I, I've gone through that and yeah. Yeah, I, I really, um, yeah, I think about, for me, the fact that we all have a place like the the um Ryan you were talking about how our different bodies react to or have different relationships with with land um have different different abilities different conditions different um different seasons for us different you know different roles um but the important thing I think is that we all do have a place and so you know, if I think about within a coastal context, um, it's not everyone's job to pull in a canoe. <laughs> you know, some people have the knowledge of how to navigate. Some people have the knowledge of what it is we're looking for. Some people have a knowledge, like have the, those, that kind of knowledge and skills um, to, to help us travel. But I think there's always been um, many you know, our, our teachings are really, there's, there's many treasures that we have in those canoes, our family, the canoe is also um, like, like a house, like a body, you know, um, like a family. And so we, we carry our relations with us who also don't, you know, it's not everyone who, we don't all have the same job. We all have different jobs. We all have different roles, different sets of knowledge. And so um, I think that's important. And it's not only important for for me, part of the, the, that aspect of queering um, and bringing all our relations along and all having a place is, is also about um, our relatives who are, um, I guess for me thinking about respectability politics and the fact that especially, as you said, you know, the, the resistance um, is exhausting, um, that if we're always struggling and, and for some of our relations are struggling more than others, struggling, you know, struggling in academia is one thing, but struggling to get through the day is another. Uh, maybe they, you know, they have equivalencies, but um, you know, there are a lot of our relatives who are also not welcome in um, our queer relatives who are also not able to be in ceremonial spaces or have access to our 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 teachings or to be in relation to our lands um, because of struggling with because of addiction, you know, because of of um, various kinds of respectability politics that say they don't belong in those in those spaces. And for me, that's also bullshit. Like we also all have a place, you know, we, we should all have access to um, uh, our, like for me, it's really about knowing the place that we have, being able to live out the responsibilities with our names and just to be at the table, to be part of the feast, to be part of the, the celebration, to be part of those seasonal relations. And um, that means, as you said, adjusting, shifting, taking up different ways to allow that to happen, to facilitate everyone being able to show up. And um, so that is part of the, I guess, the land-based work that I'm really interested in thinking about uh, that when we're inviting people together to weave cedar, to dig for clams, that it's it's not just some people, it's not just the, the certain people, you know, 
um, that we find ways so that everyone feels like that's their place. And um, that that's about gender and sexual diversity, but that's also just about the diversity of our lived realities today. And I think too much in, especially moving in scholarly circles, I see how, um, how many, you know, just, just how strong those barriers are to participation, I guess, or to feeling like people belong. Uh, and I don't want to replicate that aspect of, of academia, which is, um, it, it's not only, it, it's in the practice, I guess. It's not so much just in, in terms of thinking about the realm of ideas, but actually how we um, create like the social conditions of, of inviting people along or, or of forming a sense of, who gets to make decisions? How about how we go about doing things? You know, all of that um, is that all of our family members should feel like that's a place for them. So, um, yeah, for me, that question about our different ways of embodiment, our, our different ways of relating, is expansive. Like it should really be able to account for everyone um, in our in our families today. So, um, I really like this idea of you know thinking about the queering, um, you know, for me, the, the world building aspect of that is, again, just really accounting for what already exists. Like we have such a diverse, um, you know, community, <laughs> communities that uh, it's, it's just making it safer, I think, for all of us to be able to show up. And especially, I, you know, I think that the, I was talked about earlier, just, um, you know, coming, Alex, you've talked about kind of coming, coming in ceremonies and um, that is so gendered in, in our, in our communities, especially the, I think it's because of the coming of age ceremonies, especially for young girls is like countering the gender-based violence in our communities. So it's seen as a way, but it only, a lot of times I, like it reproduces the very binary conditions in which those, you know, which is at the basis of that violence. So um, I mean, that is certainly a, like something I continue to think about is how we can, um, uh, if, if we don't have those teachings to create new or, or look, look for different, you know, ways that we can all have those um, spaces of being held up and, and having our place affirmed. Um, I think that's something that's part of the the way of re-envisioning for me it's it's also about about justice it's about um uh you know writing the wrongs of colonialism or creating turning our back you know to to colonial ways of orienting ourselves and maybe that's also a different way of thinking about not just critique and not just struggle but turning away and um and orienting ourselves you know towards these life-affirming joyful as you said like we don't have enough space to um to celebrate and that's again within a with even within our own cultural you know feast system that is that wealth that we have the the abundance um the way that we gift one another that's all a celebration and so if doing that in a queer way through through practices that queer you know those teachings and again create space for us all to belong um you know is a way of of turning away from those um those colonial uh ways of making sense of ourselves so i'm excited let's have a feast <laughs> sydney do you have any um comments uh yeah i think i can talk for a little bit i uh i haven't been in academia in a while so i'm not well-versed in the theory, but um, hearing you all speak, um, like Alex, when you were talking, said you talked to some elders in your community and they um, said they didn't have those kinds of terms like queer and trans before colonialism. Uh, and then kind of this discussion you've all been having about querying as a verb and also like creating life-affirming communities of joy and support. I, it reminds me of like one particular afternoon, actually we had at Dishinta, um, our last semester. So maybe I'll just talk like a little bit about that. Um, so we did a gender course um, and we had, it was called gender justice. Um, and we had this really amazing afternoon 
kind of um, late into the week. Um, and I would say it was a very literal example of like querying as a as a verb. Um, and we had a guest instructor, uh, Tunshai Redvers. They were actually supposed to be um, here today, but couldn't make it. Um, but they're a, a non-binary Dene educator and, and social worker and, and activist. And they came up to the gender workshop with us. Um, and they had a big piece of paper. And on one side, they wrote masculine. On, on the other side, they wrote feminine. And at this point, the students had learned all about like the colonial history of sex and gender and like the imposed binary. And so they wrote masculine and feminine and then um, essentially drawing the binary. And then we all brainstormed the different traits and, and characteristics that, that came to mind for each side. So we had things like strong, protective, courageous, like logical, assertive, like kind of just the things that you would, you've been programmed to maybe associate with masculine. And then we had, we did the same for feminine. So we had, like gentle, intuitive, emotional, creative, nurturing, sensitive. I think we had like sun and water um, and the lists were quite long. And then Chun Chai asked everyone to think for a bit about the traits that they resonated with the most. Um, and then we went around the circle and shared what, what traits we saw in ourselves. Um, and every single person resonated with traits on both sides of the binary um, and saw themselves represented in both masculine and, and feminine ways. And it was like a really simple exercise, um, but it was a really like profound moment for, for everyone in the room, um, which we had, I think our youngest student was 16 and our oldest was around 65. Um, it felt like we had just like destroyed the patriarchy or something like in that moment, we were like, oh, <laughs> it's that easy. Not actually, but um, like we just had, I think every person really learned something about themselves and their own gender identities. And I imagine that if there had been men in the room, it would have been the same impact, like learning who you are a little bit in that moment outside of this binary was, was this really powerful thing. And then the next part of the exercise was to all go outside and spend some time out on the land alone. And in particular, observing where we might see some of these characteristics of gender in nature, and if we could see the binary gender being upheld while we were outside. Um, and so I remember walking outside and I asked one of my coworkers, Gordy, to just like take me on a spin on the um, snowmobile. And yeah, I could feel like the wind whipping around my face. He was going like really, really fast. And I kind of like started laughing a little bit to myself because I was like thinking about how silly it would feel to gender the wind. Like I couldn't really make sense of it. I was like, how it doesn't it's not possible. I don't understand how it could fit into one or the other. And um, we kind of came back and everyone kind of shared these same musings. And I, I do also remember another coworker of mine, Leanne uh, Marie Charlie, who's Northern Toshone. Um, she talked about how she noticed the water flowing under the ice on the lake and how um, like the strength and the sharpness of the ice was created by the same like gentle fluidity of the water underneath it. And um, yeah, just a really beautiful example of queerness in nature and how it just traverses so easily across these, these gendered binary characteristics. And then the third part of the exercise was to get back inside and we all had to draw what our gender identities looked like, which was a really interesting exercise. Oh, and what it felt like. Um, and everyone was like, wait, I've, I've never even been given the opportunity to really like think about this before. Um, and I, I didn't even know that I had like the power to, to do that or like to define and create my own gender identity. Um, and so, um, and I think a lot of people in that room like understood themselves as queer, but was also realizing like how anxious of an experience that can be trying to like fit, trying to make sense of your own gender and sexuality and trying to fit yourself into certain categories often like for me with very little success. Um, and in that moment, I looked at my drawing and I was like, oh, like my gender identity is just me. It's like all the different traits and quirks and things that make me Sid. And of course, that's different, like for everybody and everyone's experience won't be like that. But but for me, um, I was like, wow, how I understand myself actually has nothing to do with my body parts for me or like what anyone has told me that I'm supposed to be like. Um, it's just who I am. And that felt really profound to me, but it's definitely not a new idea. Like I, from my understanding, it's really inherent in a lot of indigenous knowledge, like knowledge systems. 
uh, and ethics, which were operating outside of the system, like long before, you know, colonialism. Um, and yeah, there was just like this less, this real realization in real time that like, um, yeah, we have like this sort of freedom to express ourselves the way that we want to. And I think it was like this, it was also, um, like I think for a lot of our students, it was not just a theory, like we were realizing, we were learning it in the classroom, but then we were also practicing and embodying it out on the land together, like with our living conditions. Um, like we're in the middle of one of the biggest lakes in the world. It's very cold at times. And in order to keep the community running, everyone at camp has to participate in a variety of roles, whether it's skidoo driving or wood chopping or fish cutting or muskrat trapping. Um, and, and what chopping wood was actually, I think, a huge source of like empowerment, I would say, for, for a lot of the women that were at camp, uh, including myself. Like, I think oftentimes it maybe it's a job that's just, just associated with men, or it's just something that automatically kind of leans that way. Um, and so there's always like a hesitation at first. And then once you get the first chop, it's like, oh, damn, that feels good. And I like, distinctly remember one student who had never chopped wood before and she was really nervous and so everyone like got around and we took a really gentle approach and it was really supportive and all of a sudden she was just chopping like crazy and she was so good at it and she we had to like pull her away back to the classroom and I remember like I remember she like lifted the axe up and brought it down and I just heard her scream like I am woman and like split the log perfectly and it was really funny, but I think it was a really powerful example of how maybe like the land um, gives everyone a space to learn and practice skills that like transcend these expectations of, of the gender binary, or at least it, it can do that. Um, and it's like this really potent example of like um, queerness in action and how like the land really supports like variance and, and provides a space for that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think for me, like queering is a practice or like even just the acknowledgement and acceptance and like celebration of how like the world actually is and, and in some ways how we all are. It's like this stripping away of all these expectations and rules that have been placed, placed on us. And um, yeah, like coming to know yourself as a whole being, um, not just as a, an imposition. And so, um yeah I I just think the land is really like one of the most powerful powerful places to do this work and I really saw it that afternoon in particular but the whole week to addition to um like it really encourages it because it doesn't conform to these like colonial ideas and knowledge systems um that were like intended to oppress others like it really shows students that not only is a different world possible but it already exists on the land around us and we can like make it happen and um yeah and then one part I forgot but it really connects to like this sort of creating joy um and like life affirming um Tunche ended the day by having the students brainstorm around three words which I maybe won't remember them but one was gender and one was like autonomy body autonomy maybe and then like self-expression and some of the words that students chose to like associate with these other words was like courage happy, freedom, choice, um, like self-construction, personal, comfortable, land, powerful. Like they were really amazing. And you could really feel in the room that people were learning a different way to see themselves and, and the world around them. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, I just, it was, yeah, it was really uh, an amazing like experience and a really potent example, I think, of how indigenous land-based education, like um inherently by its very nature can like really do some powerful work of questioning and undoing these these colonial gender and, and sexuality constructs on the land uh and in learning communities while also strengthening students relationship to to the land around them so yeah that would be some, that would be my thoughts on that I think I think that um, that really does speak to like the power that education can actually be for a lot of people, and I think that like for those of us who are in academia, it can be a very like um, 
very isolating um, place. Um, but I also have to remind myself that it was also one of the places that I was able to develop um, a lot of these ideas, a lot of the, the important work that I'm doing now by, by learning from um, and meeting people maybe first on paper, like reading their work um, from a lot of kind of queer indigenous scholars, people writing on queer indigeneity um, and, and trying to create these spaces in these institutions themselves, I really think is um, for some like that you don't know where to go um, if you're trying to reconnect with your own community. Some people are also disconnected, so they don't know where to go. So sometimes this is the first place in these in these institutions where they've developed those relationships. And I think the work that Dushinta is doing and also the land-based programs at the University of Saskatchewan, um, I think that those, that those are really important um, moments for people to, to build those relationships as a kind of an in-between place for people to then um, care, continue that work afterwards. Um, and so I, I still kind of understand education, academia, with having some use in, in that sense and, and can be transformative when done by following these kinds of ethics. Um, I also think too, I'm just hearing um, kind of the, the, the way the conversation is going um, right now as reconnecting with the land. Um, one of the things that we've, at least for Blackfoot people that we've encountered um, is, um, especially in Calgary, where there is a diverse um, kind of indigenous population, is when we talk about queer indigeneity as kind of this boundless relationality can be problematic when um, in some indigenous planning circles they talk about, um, I know this was an issue at the university or in Toronto in a lot of queer spaces when they talk about the land is for everyone, the land is like for everyone to connect with. That's also been an issue here, but it's not coming from settlers, it's coming from indigenous people who are not Blackfoot or who are not from Treaty 7. And they talk about that the land is for everyone to connect with. And that creates a whole issue around when we're talking about queer indigeneity, about fluidity, relationality, but there's an also an importance with talking about boundaries. And I think that tends to get overlooked a lot of the times, not just in academia, but in a lot of activist circles and a lot of um, just in general, like where do, how do we think about boundaries in this sense now? Um, I think there's, there's this impulse all automatically to disrupt boundaries because they've contained a lot of um, our sense of being, um, our potential to imagine otherwise, to act otherwise. But I also think for Blackfoot people in this space where we have such a tense historical relationship, even prior to um, colonization with um, other nations where we had um, feuds, we, we did not have good relations. We didn't know um, uh, Cree or um, Assiniboine members of the Iron Confederacy as being our relatives. We understood them as being kinds of strangers or in some cases, in extreme cases, as enemies. And so that, that creates a whole host of issues contemporarily when we're in these spaces trying to do this work where um, there's, again, even contested um, notions of whose territory this we're on. What does it mean to acknowledge the wrong people? Um, I think that is also something that um, where, the, where the emphasis is, especially and importantly on gender and sexual diversity, there's also an element of, of this that has to relate to um, how do we uphold um, the jurisdiction and authority of people's territory we're on. And I see that happening too in places like Vancouver, where there are so many um, events taking place where um, sometimes Indigenous peoples, we think we're better at, at um, acknowledging and doing this relational work and we're not sometimes. Um, and so how do we, how do we uphold um, uh, the, this ethics of reciprocal visiting? Um, how do we do that in a good way? And I think that that sometimes gets forgotten um, when we're going to these different spaces. Um, how do we balance those two things, right? And I see that especially in Calgary with a lot of queer indigenous organizing where there's a diversity of people who are from different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, wanting to do this work. But um, the emphasis is on uh, this kind of almost boundless sense of relationality. Where does the, um, where does upholding um, 
kind of the the territory, the people on whose land you're you're doing this work. How do you how do you do that in a good way by acknowledging those, um, whether that's conceptualized as jurisdictional authority, territory, um, very, very tricky um, and something that I think this impulse for desire and wanting to do things in a good way also can move us away from acknowledging how to engage in conflict differently. Sometimes we won't, we will just kind of, especially for me, I don't like conflict. And so sometimes I just, it's really hard. Sometimes I won't even engage with it. Other times you have to, but how do you do it in a way that can lead to kind of transformative outcomes, I think is really difficult. And I think that that's something that might be um, overlooked in a lot of the queer indigenous uh, organizing. I'm not sure if either of you have thoughts on that, but, but that's something that I've definitely seen in spaces like Calgary, where there's a diversity of indigenous backgrounds and how we do that work by also it, adhering to kind of the people's territories on who, um, whose land we're doing this work on. I have some thoughts, but Alex, do you wanna respond first? Or? Go ahead, Sarah. I just, I really think um, this is something that comes up a lot, <laughs> probably everywhere, but um, I do think that for me, it's really a question of like, whose house am I in? You know, that we can all gather and there can be a space for everyone. And that sort of, ex as you're saying, expansive, um, you know, I really think of Diane Million talks about making community wherever we are, you know, that we don't all have, it's not all safe, it's not necessarily safe for all of us to go home always, or there's lots of reasons why we might um, not be in our territories. I mean, that's just the reality for a lot of us. Um, but it's, you know, thinking about whose house we're in is for me a way of um, thinking about authority, as you're saying, and also about boundaries, but also about consent, you know, that we we have always visited each other. We've always, and yes, there's been conflict, as you're saying, Ryan, um, but we've also had ways of, of asking here, like asking permission to come ashore, um, thinking about how we build good relations across our nations. Um, and, and so thinking about whose house we're in um, and, and being mindful of that, thinking about that as a principle for coming together, I think is is also really important. And it is, unfortunately, I do think in, in both um, kind of circles where we're involved in activism, organizing, you know, that can get missed other than maybe like a land acknowledgement and then you kind of move on, but it doesn't set the organizing principles. Um, but also, especially in academia, I think that because of how Indigenous studies, Indigenous thought is seen sometimes as like traversing across all, like it just moves around. Um, that is, yeah, that is a, a, a real, um, I guess for me, I actively, I, I actively work to um, not just in my, you know, the, on a syllabus or at the beginning of a class, but I structure my teaching to, to start with the land beneath our feet. We're always on land. We're always in some, well, unless we're in water. Well, there's also land beneath water, but we're always, you know, we can always orient ourselves right where we are. We don't have to, it's not, all, it's not out there. You know, I think we, um, of course we, we can go outside of a building like to, to do that, but we're always in place and we're always able to orient ourselves within the set of governing relations where we are. So, you know, I, for me, that knowledge, whatever it is we're studying, we start here and build outward. And, um, and so when I'm not in my own territories, that does start with um, thinking about whose house we're in and, and what my place is here and how I can take the floor, how I can speak here and, and doing that protocol. Um, but I think this is really important, especially uh, um, that we don't seek to replace, like, you know, we don't want to replicate the harms of, of colonialism where we're going to someone else's home and saying, well, now this, now we have authority here, you know, so how we have to really think carefully and, and relationally about, about that, I guess. Um, but I do think that there are practices. It's just that it's always the norm, especially within institutions. Our institutions have 
when we're as academics, our institutions have ways of reproducing even within indigenous circles, forms of power, whether that's around gender, you know, who gets held up as having authority there, you know, there's a real investment in having singular sort of superstars, singular voices who are successful. And that's not, you know, we've always created knowledge co collectively. It's through coming together, gathering, we having different roles. Um, and so con we, we will have to constantly counter that and create other spaces of belonging. Um, that is quite frustrating, as you're saying, it's, it's exhausting. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I've realized that I'll, if I just um, always try to remind everyone else, like, well, you know, whose house are you in? You're not doing this in a good way. Then that will take energy away from building kind of otherwise, as we were saying before. So, um, yeah. Thanks for that question. <laughs> I think um, that's come up with um, our, our land-based program. Uh, and one of the ways that we've discussed it and, and enacted is like only going places we're invited. And um, especially right now when there's like so many different places that are doing land-based, it's just become so popular and there's so many different versions of what it means. And because land-based education is so highly contextual, um, what it means for one community is different from what it means to another. Um, so, and then also like you have this layer of neoliberalism too, that, you know, is, um, reinforces people going and experiencing, you know, the top of the mountain or, or, you know, that kind of thing. And so we have some really good discussions about that and then, um, figuring out how, you know, um, how to, how to be good guests and visitors without, creating um, some kind of pan-Indianism that, that's really not serving, you know, the nations that are hosting or even ourselves. Um, and a lot of times we'll get a call like, oh, we want to set up a land based and we want to go to Hawaii, for example. Can you give us some numbers? And to explain how many generations the relationship is, it takes time and knowledge. Like it's not just, oh, I went there and met a native Hawaiian or went to Cree country and met a swampy Cree person. And like, you know, these relationships that we have with land are, are literally generations old and, and they're part of our stories and our history and all of that. So I think that's the part, um, the, the, the care part of things and the, the slowing of things. Um, that maybe the COVID time allowed allowed us to reflect more on what that means. And um, also just, just to kind of go back to like the queering part and, and the queering of relationships um, that when the interesting thing that happened during COVID was like, we heard a lot of stories of land kind of regenerating and so um, I think we were doing that on a theoretical level, on a practical level, but also praxis and, and in our relationships too. Sometimes there needs to be a, uh, like not a breakup, but uh, um, time apart. And so maybe that was a time to do that too between our own nations so that we could um, kind of refresh, do a reboot on um, reconnecting to our our own structures and governance structures and kinship structures. Um, and then I think the animals needed that as well. And I, I always tell the story because it was just so beautiful, like, especially right at the beginning of COVID where like everyone was just scared to leave their house. And I was just sitting in that darn chair for like, it seemed like months on end, you know, barely going outside, but I had this window that overlooks the lake and the lake was frozen and it was minus 40. Um, but then one day this lynx and this fox went trotting by and um, they were together, like they were a couple. And it was really, um, it was beautiful, but it was also so such a great example of, of um, just how queer 
um, nature is and how queer we all are. And the, the links, because its stride was so long, it would, you know, take a few strides and it like kind of stop, stop, exasperated, look back. And then the fox would be just a given her trying to catch up. And, and then the fox would catch up and the lynx would start going again. And then they went all the way across the bay here. And then you could hear a dog and then they turned around and they started running back. But, and then in that case, the, the lynx waited for the fox and went behind it. But the fox is also in heat. And so they had like this little sexual thing going on too, which I don't know the details of, but, um, but just, you know, just the, those kind of moments that are just really good reminders. And um, I think, um, I think that's something that I always think back to, to, re to remind myself, like sometimes we do have to slow down and just pay attention. And even if it's just looking out that window um, or if it's going outside, if you're able to, um, that, that those, um, those beautiful um, queer moments are there. And there's so much noise that um, colonialism has created that sometimes we have to filter out that noise and, and that includes like within our own communities and our own community relationships and how we um, how we treat others and, and when we're on other people's lands or in their houses, so to speak, so. I just wanted, to, I love that story so much. And I just, another thing I meant to mention earlier related to the slowing down is, um, I've really been thinking, uh, I'm trying to, and I'm trying to do some collaborative writing as well about uh, preparation, you know, that we, we don't all, we don't always just have like the gathering of the ceremony or the work we prepare and often, you know, for us, for, for feasts, um, it takes three years off, you know, often to, to do that preparation properly. And so I've really, especially in an, you know, in contexts where there's emphasis on um like the pace of things you know is 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 not healthy but it's also not realistic to that the you know honoring our relations fully and um so i've really you know a lot of people move for example research online and doing land-based work it's you can't the knowledge it's impossible to to do that so i just sort of have um, not done that which has meant putting a lot of um thought and and care into like having a picnic with someone individually or going to talk to elders um, when it was safe to do so outside or um, gifting people like just other things we had to, that other parts of the preparation for future work that will is also um, a slowing down to honor the nature of the relations and the kinds of care that people need right now and the people's capacity, you know, that and my own capacity. Um, but it, it is also a part of preparation towards future work. And, and I think sometimes we just focus on the work part or the gathering part, but you know, that we can, there's a way of, um, there's a lot of other things that are possible because we've slowed down, because we've noticed, because we've looked out the window, um, you know, which is really beautiful. So, yeah. Do, uh, does anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask that hasn't been asked or to build on any other comments that were made? I probably do, but I'm running out of steam here because I've been up. I had to drive halfway to Winnipeg already and back this morning, so I'm pretty tired. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just think um, I'm just really grateful for this time and I hope we can have more um, more spaces like this, you know, more opportunities to come together and also to, you know, the kinds of practices um, that everyone has described to share across our our communities, our, our contexts and, and to speak to each other because so much we're speaking against, you know, or countering norms that are imposed or trying to work against I think speaking to each other there's so much um like 
beauty that comes from that. And, and it's, it's also affirming instead of just that draining work that, that you described earlier, you know, Ryan, just that it's tiring, but this doesn't, I mean, I might be tired, but this doesn't feel tiring. It feels exciting as well. So I'm really grateful and, and hopefully this is just one of many. So thank you for the invitation. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you everyone for um, making it out. I know that it was really kind of, it's always hard to schedule so many different um, people's work schedules and especially meeting um, for today. Uh, I know it was unfortunate that we weren't able to have everyone in attendance, but I mean, things come up and I think it just speaks to the nature of, of um, trying to do this work, but also acknowledging the importance of having more of these gatherings. So. Um, I think that this is a, a really good foundation to start um, future dialogues and um, I'm really looking forward to that and yeah I'll just um, I think we've been going at it for for almost two hours now so um, we had really good great conversations and it's um, I feel really again uh, privileged and honored and just really grateful to um, have learned um, so much from both of you um, your your work has been really central to a lot of the stuff that I've been thinking through. And um, I just, uh, yeah, both of you have really um, are perfect for this because of the work that you're doing, the questions you're engaged in. And um, yeah, it's just, again, really, 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 really grateful. Um, I'll hand it over to um, Sydney um, for any kind of closing remarks, but um, yeah. Yeah, um, I guess I just want to say thank you guys so much. Um, say thank you folks so much for um, joining Deshinta and Nesa today to share your experiences and all of your brilliance. Um, it really was such a joy to hear from all of you and um, the work you're doing is so important. And um, yeah, just really grateful that we were able to make it here today to uplift and, and celebrate you all. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. Like Massey Cho, everyone, stay safe, take care. And um, yeah, I really look forward to definitely connecting again in the future. And Thanks for organizing everything, Sydney and Ryan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so good to see you, Sarah. Hope, hope we yeah, see all of too. you in person. Yeah. Yeah. Gila Kasla. Thanks, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Bye.